Okay. Uh, this week is electronics design. The assignment is uh, this is a circuit we'll be using in two weeks when we start programming. On this board is a microcontroller, an in-circuit programming header, a crystal for time, a pull-up resistor for reset, a capacitor for filtering, and a header for communication. So a very simple board. And you'll see um, on the board, um, these pins are available, and these pins are available. And what I want you to do this week is um, take that board, you, you redraw it. Uh, just start from the image, not a file. You draw it in a design tool. Add a button and an LED to it so that you can push the button as an input and you can blink the light as an output. And then I want you to make the board. And then in two weeks, we're going to program it. And extra credit would also be to simulate it before you actually make it. So to do this, we need to learn about the parts and the design tools. So uh, first thing I'm going to cover is uh, introduction to the components. And then the second will be the uh, circuits and design tools. Okay, so start with components. Uh, this is a link to notes from the physics of information technology class with the book that goes with it. This talks about the physics of the devices. I won't explain that today, but there's more there. Starting with first component is wire. Um, we make a lot of use of ribbon cable in the lab. You can use it as a ribbon, but you can also peel it apart in strands and use the wire separately. It's spec'd by the AWG is a standard. And so if you do AWG, um, you'll find a number of versions of tables that relate the wire gauge to the current it can handle. And so uh, these are AWG numbers. And then uh, this is the resistance, and then this is the maximum current you can use. So wire is sized by AWG. One other detail is um, uh, uh, as you go up in frequency, current goes near the surface of a wire. So for low frequency, a solid wire is good. But for high frequency, you want to use stranded wire that has more surface area. Uh, just one, one, one note I would like to make for, for the benefit of the class as well. Um, the numbering of AWG numbers, it goes, well, for me, it went the opposite way as I would expect. So the lower numbers are bigger gauge wires. Yep. 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 Uh, buttons. There's two kinds of surface mount switches we have in the inventory. Um, this is a, a um, button that's normally open, and if you look on the bottom of the package, there's two bands like that, and then there's pads. Electrically, these are connected, and then there's a switch here. So you can connect to either of the pads on either side. It's normally open when you push it, it's closed. <clears throat> also, there's a standard slide switch we have in the inventory if you want to leave it open or closed. Okay, resistors, a uh, symbol for a resistor looks like this. And what a resistor does is current it is the ratio of voltage to resistance. Um, the resistor is specced by the resistance value. Um, and then a crucial number is the tolerance and then the capacity. So we're using quarter watt resistors. 
That's the amount of power they can dissipate. The error is good to a percent. And then 1206 is the size of the package. And you can get all of these in wide ranges from many watts and down to um, uh, small fractions of a percent tolerance. Uh, capacitors. For a capacitor. Question yep. about the, um, the resistors. Yep. What's, the, what's the reason for choosing um, this, the, the range of resistors that the Fab Lab has? instead of going for one of the E-numbers, the E-ranges? E uh, oh, sorry, instead of choosing which range? So th th this, this is just convenient one that we've historically used in designs. It's not a profound choice. What would you do instead? Um, there's, there's the, um, uh, and I don't know if it's European specific, but there, there you have the, um, like the E-12 and the E-24. Um, it's a different range. It's, it's, I don't have the numbers here at the moment, but um, um, it, yeah. I, I, I'm not familiar with E number ranges, but I'll look after the, 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 the answer for the ones that we've been using is just accumulated historically as convenient across designs. A general rule of thumb is if your design is sensitive to the value of a resistor, something's wrong with it. Then in general, uh, the resistor shouldn't be a sensitive value in a design. Okay, going on. A capacitor stores charge on the plate. Um, the capacitance is the ratio of the charge on the plate to the voltage. Or if you take derivatives, the current uh, which is the rate of uh, change of the capacitance is C capacitance times the rate of change of the voltage. And so the rate at which voltage changes um, times capacitance is the current. So DC doesn't get through, but AC does. Um, so you, you can use them as filters and for charge storage. Um, these are unpolarized capacitors we use. And so this one is one microfarad. Capacitors are limited in the voltage range they tolerate, which can be very low. This is 50 volts. Typically, they're lower resolution, 10%. And again, a design that depends sensitively on the capacitor typically is a bad idea. You don't want that to be a sensitive value. Um, for higher capacitance, um, the capacitors, instead of just plates, are polarized, and, and there's a plus and a minus side. And so for polarized capacitors, this is an example of a super cap. Um, this is a crazy number, 10 farads. These didn't exist a few years back so conveniently. Um, this is such a big capacitor, um, you can use it as a short-term battery. You can store power in it. Um, these are electrochemical, not just electric fields, but there's an electrochemical reaction. And the voltage is much lower on these. This one is 2.7 volts. They typically have a very low voltage they can run at. But super caps are good as like uh, something in between um, uh, a battery. You can quickly charge them to store power. Um, a, a crystal or resonator electrically looks like a capacitor that has a piezo element in it. And so voltage makes mechanical motion and mechanical motion makes voltage. And there's a resonant peak. Um, these are the crystals we use. And then for the circuits with them, they need external capacitors. And then the resonators we use are lower resolution, uh, but a handy package and they have the capacitance built into them. So we use those to tell time. Um, an inductor you draw like this, and what it does is the voltage drop across it is the inductance times the time derivative of the current. A capacitor current is the derivative of voltage, and inductor voltage is the derivative of current. So um, inductors pass DC but block high frequencies. And so this is a choke we have. 
And uh, most common use of these is to pass DC signals but block out higher frequencies. You can also use them in resonance structures. Uh, diodes, sorry, this one. Um, a diode limits current to go in one direction. The current goes in the direction of the arrow. Um, there's an or is it goes in alphabetical order. Um, sorry. Um, it goes from anode to cathode, is how you remember. The anode side um, goes from there to the cathode side. Um, so a diode has an IV curve, and it looks something like this. This is the voltage across it. This is the current. Um, it doesn't block. Current can't go in the reverse direction up to a limit. It can go in the forward direction after a drop. And so there's a drop before forward conduction, and there is a little bit of reverse current. Um, a PN junction is just two semiconductors. A shot key diode is a metal semiconductor junction, and those can have lower thresholds. So we use a standard shot key diode that has a smaller uh, voltage drop um, uh, as a standard rectification diode. Then we have Zener diodes. Colonial? Yep. Sorry, but we're not getting your screen. Sorry? We're not getting your screen here. Are, are other people getting the screen? Yeah, we can see it. We can see that. Yes. OK, that's a local problem at your site. Um, uh, and if you're having trouble with the conference, you can get it through the um, MCU stream. If you go to okay, if you go you. to the web page for the MCU. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, now a shot key di a Zener diode looks similar, but you make a little hook, and what it does is the IV curve again doesn't conduct in the reverse direction, conducts in the forward direction until you get to a breakdown voltage, and then there's a sharp drop where it conducts in the backwards direction. And that has to do with the conduction bands um, crossing internally in the physics. Uh, and so zeners are very handy to set a voltage. You can clip a voltage with a zener, and you prevent it from going above or below it. Then finally, light-emitting diodes um, the way those work is it's a, a diode um, that emits light from the junction, from electrons and holes recombining. Now, remember, the diode, um, an ideal diode is a perfect conductor. A real diode isn't quite perfect, but it's a very good conductor. And so if you just connect a battery to a diode, what you'll do is you'll draw as much current as the battery can produce, limited by its internal resistance, which generally means if you have a good power supply, you'll blow up the diode. So diodes always need current limiting. And so the way you do that is you have a resistor in line with the diode. And um, remember Ohm's law, I equals V over R. Given the voltage, you assume there's almost no drop across the diode for one diode. And so you pick this resistor so that the current through the diode is the amount you want. And the current through the diode is limited by the diode you choose. Typical number is from milliamps up to amps. And so um, in many sample circuits you'll see I'll give you there'll be a 1k resistor for a 5 volt supply um, to do 5 milliamps current. So here's an example of the diode we're using and the diode data sheet will give you the, the relationship between current and brightness and the maximum current it can uh, withstand. 
And so this goes up to 40 milliamps for this little diode. Um, there's a fun vendor, super bright um, LEDs. I'll make a note for that. Uh, th this is where you can get diodes that are so bright it would hurt your eyes to look at it. Okay, that's diodes. Then we come to transistors. Um, uh, a bipolar transistor is semiconductor. There's a, a uh, NPN or PNT. Um, those look like um, there's an arrow pointing towards or away from the plate, um, uh, a collector, emitter, and a base. Uh, we're not going to be using them for anything. And the reason is um, a MOSFET, you draw it, it looks like this. That's an N MOSFET. A P MOSFET has a circle here. So in the MOSFET, um, there's a gate, and then there's a source and a drain. And the gate, what's going on in the MOSFET is you have a semiconductor, there's an insulator, and then there's a metal plate. And so depending on the MOSFET type, a voltage on the plate puts either electrons or um, holes, which are positive charges, in a channel, and then you have the, the, the source and the drain. The resistance of the channel depends on the number of carriers. And so what it means is the voltage, the resistance depends on voltage. In a bipolar transistor, it's always consuming current from the gate. So you have to keep providing current to turn it on. A MOSFET only consumes a little bit of current to charge it up. You're providing voltage, not current. And so one of the benefits of a MOSFET is it doesn't keep using current to keep it turned on. Um, another one is uh, the conductivity can be very good. And so this is one of the neatest parts we'll be using. Uh, this SOT23 package MOSFET that's about 10 cents in volume has just amazing specs. It's, um, it's a logic level one, which means you can turn it on with five volts. Uh, many transistors need a higher voltage. And then um, when, when it's turned on, the resistance fully on is only um, a tenth of an ohm, very low resistance, but it can go up to 30 volts and 1.7 amps. And to give you a sense, the motors on something like a shop bot might go up to one amp. You'll be very hard pressed to do anything that would use uh, that much current. And so this tiny little transistor can handle 1.7 amps. And one of the parts in the inventory we have goes even bigger to 16 amps. And so this little part can handle a huge amount of current. Now, what you do is it, it switches very quickly. It switches on the order of microseconds. And so we'll see you, you pulse width modulate. You turn the MOSFET either all the way on or all the way off. And by varying the fraction of time that it's on, you can continuously vary very large currents through it. And so that's what we'll use to do power electronics. Then batteries um, make voltage. The thing to know about a battery is effectively internally there's a resistor. The impedance of the battery sets um, how the current it supplies relates to the voltage. For an ideal battery, the resistor is zero. For a little cell, it 
can be quite large. Larger power supplies have a smaller effective internal impedance, which means voltage and resistance are, are less uh, connected. Um, then we have regulators. Uh, a regulator has an input, a ground, and an output. And so you provide a unregulated unregul voltage in, and you get a voltage out. And so uh, this is an example of a, um, a LDO means low dropout. This is a, a five volt regulator. And so you provide um, a voltage in, and it provides a voltage out. The thing to know about, and then the couple things to know about regulators. Um, So it's, um, a classic use of this is the microcontroller can't go over 5 volts. And so if you have a 9-volt battery, um, you go into the regulator, um, and then the output goes to the microcontroller. And then depending on the regulator, this might be 5 volts or 3.3 volts or, or lower. Um, the regulators need a big capacitor to regulate. There's a control loop. And so you always need one on the output. And it, it helps, but it's not absolutely essential. It helps to put the one on the input, and that's for charge storage, to help quickly provide power. Um, whatever this voltage is, let's say it's 5 volts, the regulator needs um, above that voltage. And so we're using a low dropout regulator, but the dropout is from the order of a volt, which means you need to put in at least six volts here to get five volts there. There's a, a range. And so the ones we're using go up to 30 volts. So this can be anything between six and 30 in, but, and you get five volts out. But this has to be at least six. If you put five volts in, you don't get five volts out. The regulator basically fails. The control loop doesn't work. You need enough voltage for it to regulate. Uh, the other thing about regulators is um, if you have a, depending on the regulator, if you put the negative voltage in, if you connect it backwards, you'll fry the regulator. And so um, if you want to prevent that, you just put a diode on the input to the regulator. Um, if the connection is polarized so you can't fry it or you know what you're doing, you don't need the diode. But if there's a chance the regulator is going to be connected backwards, um, you put a diode so current can go into it but can't be pulled out from the input. Yeah, um, uh, the voltage drop of the diode. Say it again. Take, it, take into account the, the, the voltage drop across the diode. Yeah, I'll talk about that when I get to power. Oh, yeah. OK, op amps. Um, Op amps used to be more important. Um, an op amp is an amplifier. It has a minus and a plus. And what comes out is the difference between minus and plus times a really big number. And you, you never use it this way. The open loop gain uh, just is a big number, like a million. Um, but what you do is you make a, a network. And so for example, if you have a resistor coming in and a resistor in feedback, and then you ground this. The output here is this, the input times the ratio of these two resistor values. So you can use op amps for gain, and you can use them for filtering. And so here's the op amp, standard op amp we use. It's an amazing part. Again, it's a dollar in quantity, and it's got spectacular specs um, that, again, didn't exist uh, not that long ago. So um, it's reasonably fast, as fast as the processors, so tens of megahertz, but extremely low noise. It's nanovolts per root hertz, so very, very, very low noise amplifier. And then there's a gain bandwidth product, which is how much amplification you can do in one stage. And um, about 100 is typical of the gain you can get in one stage from an op amp. So we use that to make small signals bigger. The reason it's less common is the microcontrollers also now have amplifiers internal to them. 
And so a lot of where we used to use op amps, we now do with gain within the processors themselves. And we'll cover that in a couple of weeks. But to use the external op amps when you need more gain or filtering or lower noise. Go ahead, Bus. Or if you need full follower. Yeah. Um, you can also use them if you have signals without much compliance. You can use the op amp to make a weak signal have the ability to source more current. That's right. Um, okay, next is microcontrollers. Um, so if you go to, here we are, DigiKey is a common electronics vendor. DigiKey has 43,000 microcontrollers in its inventory. Um, we'll largely be using AVRs in this class and some STMs, and we'll talk about why. This class has a lot to do with what makes, this part has a lot to do with what makes the class possible. Um, this is 67 cents in quantity. Um, it's a microcontroller that runs at, with a 50 nanosecond clock. And internal to it is all this stuff, analog to digital, digital to analog, timers, counters, memories. It's full of peripherals. And so a big part of the class is going to be how you program these. And there's a lot of functions that, that used to be done with analog circuits that you can now do with digital logic because the processors are so fast. So many of the designs aren't fully analog or digital. They involve a few analog components connected to fast, low-level code. And then finally, we're going to spend a week on seeing lots of sensors and a week on seeing lots of output devices. So I won't talk about those now. So conceptually, to do this week's assignment, what you're going to do is start with the microcontroller, take a free pin, and then from that pin, you'll have a resistor and an LED going to ground. Or you could um, take the power supply and have a resistor and an LED going into the pin. So either the Either current flows out from the pin to ground, or current flows into the pin through the LED. Either works fine, but by doing that, you'll connect the pin to the LED. Then for the switch, um, what you can do is have a pull-up resistor to the supply, and then you have the switch going to ground. However, that's so common that inside the processor itself, there are, are pull-up resistors you can turn on. So all you have to do is make a switch going to ground. And when it's open, the internal pull-up carries the pin high. And then when you close the switch, it goes low. Okay? So you can do more than that, but that's the minimum for this week. Um, but we have to talk about the circuit design. 